Are you getting pumped? All right. So now you're now you're sufficiently pumped for some more computer science lecture three. Assorted topics, uh, arithmetic, assignment, plus plus stuff like that, leading eventually into for loops. So assignment, arithmetic, especially the mod operation, a little bit of stuff about printing, um, some special notation, comparison operations, and then finally for loops. Okay, first thing to note. Uh, the equal sign does not mean equals. It means is assigned or gets. So when we saw with variables, we can say int x equals 7. That actually means that x is being assigned the value of 7. It's not setting, it's not like saying that, you know, mathematically x is equal to 7. It's saying that the current value of x is being assigned 7. You can think of this as kind of like an arrow where the information flows from the right to the left. So 7 is flowing into x. Um, now values can of course be reassigned later. Go try this out on the Moodle. So we've got int x is assigned 7, and then we say x is assigned x plus 4. What values x now hold uh, at the end of, of this second statement? So, you know, pause me and go ahead and answer that. I hope you came up with 11, and what that means is the new value of x is being assigned the old value of x plus 4. This is a situation where this assignment statement is obviously very different than what an equal sign means in algebra, because obviously you would never have a situation where x is algebraically equal to x plus 4. Well, something can never be equivalent to itself plus 4. That wouldn't make any sense. But remember, this means assignments, or saying x is assigned x plus 4. New value of x is the old value plus 4. Bam, 11. So... We saw that using division with integers does integer division, which is only going to keep the quotient. In other words, it ignores the remainder. Um, what if we do want that remainder, though? What if we just care about the remainder? Well, luckily, there's a symbol, uh, the percent sign, which does what's called mod, or modular arithmetic, or take the modulus, modulus being another term for remainder, um, which is going to return only the remainder. So... 7 divided by 4, and sometimes integer division is sometimes called div, so 7 div 4 is 1 because of integer division, because 4 goes into 7 only one time. We don't care about the remainder because these are, these are integers and we're just asking for the quotient. Now 7 mod 4, using this mod operator, this is 3. 4 goes into 7 one time, but there's a remainder of 3. The mod operator, we just care about the remainder of 3. So head on over to Moodle. What is 6 mod 8? Did you come up with 6? If so, you're correct. Uh, 8 goes into 6 0 times. The quotient here would be 0, but the remainder is 6. Um, you know, because if you sort of... I mean, this is easier to show on a board, but like 8 divides into 6 0 times. Remainder there is 6. Um, here's another one to try out on the Moodle. Uh, x mod 7. Now, we don't know what x is. You know, assume it's some positive integer. Uh, what's the maximum result? So if we do x mod 7, what's the maximum possible value we could get back out of that? And if you said 6, you're correct. If we mod by 7, we're going to get values from 0 to 6. We could never get 7. So think about it. Um, 3 mod 7 is 3, because 7 goes into 3 0 times remainder of 3. 4 mod 7 is 4. 5 mod 7 is 5. 6 mod 7 is 6. 7 mod 7 is 0, because 7 divides into 7 once evenly with no remainder. The remainder there is 0. Now, uh, 8 mod 7 is 1, because 7 goes into 8 once with a remainder of 1, and so on. So the maximum value you're going to get back is going to be 6, uh, because if you have a value where um, you add one more to that, well, you're just going to add one to the quotient, the remainder cycles back around to 0. And uh, I could demo this easier on the board. I left myself a note there to demo this back from when these were just lecture slides, but I don't have a board, so I can't demo it. So print versus print line. Print line, uh, 
it prints and then outputs a new line or an enter character, a uh, return key. Whereas uh, system.out.print, this prints, but it doesn't output a new line. There's not a real complicated difference here. Uh, if we print line hello and then how are you, the output's going to be hello and then a separate line how are you. If we change these from print lines to just print and we do hello, how are you, you'll get hello, how are you all in the same line. And if there were another print statement here, this would start printing again here because this is not going to automatically output those new lines. Um, so that's another thing you want to keep in mind. Sometimes it's useful to use print instead of print line. Um, plus plus and plus equal. <clears throat> Java has a lot of these shorthand operations. So if x is an int, then x plus plus is the same as saying x equal x plus 1, or x is assigned x plus 1. Um, and you can also say, well, x equal x plus 1. You can also write this x plus equal 1. Um, these all mean the same thing. Plus plus only works with 1. Um, plus equal can work with anything. So you, you say x equal x plus 1. That can be written x plus equal 1. You could also write x equals x plus 5, and that could be written x plus equal 5. Whatever you want. And because there's a plus plus, there's also a minus minus. So x minus minus is the same as x equals x minus 1. And of course, x equals x minus 1 can be also be written x minus equals 1. Um, there were reasons back in the early 70s that this minus equal and plus equal were useful operators. Now they're just kind of shorthand. They're very useful. Um, you'll see them a lot. You, you, you could never write them if you wanted to, but it would be virtually impossible to be a programmer and not um, run into these at some point. The plus equals, um, minus equals, and plus plus and minus minus, they're, they're just ubiquitous. And I should mention, because there's plus equal and minus equal, there's also like slash equals for division and times equals for multiplication, though those are much less commonly used. So you may have heard of the programming language C++. This is actually a pun, a computer science pun. Um, C++ is an improvement to C. It's like one better than C. So they just did a plus plus on the C programming language and they got C++. This is actually what, what passes for humor around here. Like we, we in our field find this very uh, funny. I should mention that there's a um, long history of these kinds of puns and the names of things. There's a tool for building compilers called YACC, Y-A-C-C, which stands for Yet Another Compiler Compiler, which is, is in and of itself kind of funny because um, it was like another tool after there were a bunch of other tools before it. Uh, now there was a new version of YACC that came out, and you know what they named that, of course? Yeah, that's a good guess. They named it bison, because a bison is like a yak, but even bigger and better, you know, because a yak is like a type of, you know, four-legged animal that lives not in Galesburg. So there's also comparison operators um, for doing comparisons. Um, we'll talk about these more kind of in the future, but we're, we're sort of going to see them over the course of uh, learning for loops later in this lecture. So when you want to compare two values, um, less than predictably means less than, greater than means greater than. Um, if you want to do less than or equal, you literally write a less than sign with an equal after it, and greater than or equal is a greater than sign with an equal after it. To check if two things are equal, we can't use an equal sign because we already have that meaning is assigned. So we actually use two equal signs next to each other, which, you know, makes no sense, but that's, that's how we chose to do things back in the 70s and we're stuck with it. Uh, and if you check if things are not equal, we actually do exclamation equals. Sometimes um, uh, this exclamation is sometimes pronounced bang, so bang equals. Um, and so that'll give us our, our uh, equal, equal, and not equal, so is equal and not equal to. Um, these, yeah, these symbols are kind of stupid, but um, you, just, you just have to understand that that's what they mean. It, it's a little weird that that's what we're stuck with. But, you know, like I said, people made a lot of weird decisions in the 70s that we're stuck with, and that's one of them. So let's talk about for loops. A for loop lets us execute a block of statements one or more times. These are known as definite loops, because uh, we know ahead of time, by looking at the loop, how many times that block of statements that we're going to execute multiple times, we know how many times it's going to execute um, ahead of time. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll learn about what are called indefinite loops. So these are loops where we actually don't know how many times the block of statements is going to execute. 
indefinite loops usually are waiting for some kind of an input. So if you think about like, um, you know, uh, any, I'm trying to think of a good example, like uh, some sort of a, a video game or something like that, and it asks you to, um, you know, choose if you want to go left or right, and you keep picking backwards, and that's not one of the choices. It'll say, well, backwards isn't one of the choices. Try again. And then you're like, forwards. And it's like, well, forwards not one of the choices. you got to pick left or right. Try again. Well, how many times is that loop going to keep happening? Well, it's going to keep happening until you get around to picking left or right. And if you never pick left or right, then it'll just kind of go on forever. Um, so that's an indefinite loop. It's going to keep happening until somebody picks one of the things that we're looking for. Um, otherwise, you're just going to keep asking. So the main components of a for loop we've got the word for and then we've got parentheses and then inside the parentheses we have something that's an initializer with a semicolon the condition with a semicolon and then the update then we've got our brackets and then a block of statements also known as the body so these are the four major things initializer condition update and body um, now the initializer happens once at the beginning of the loop the condition is actually checked before executing the block of statements. If the condition is true, we do the block of statements. If it's false, we actually jump down here and just do the rest of the code. The loop is then over. We call that exiting the loop, or sometimes you'll hear people say kicking out of the loop. Um, the update, this is applied at the end of the block every time the block executes. This will all make sense when we start looking at some examples, but I want to just formally go through this. So. This creates a flowchart. The initializer happens once. We check the condition. If it's true, we do the body, we do the update, and then we kind of jump back here and check the condition again. If the condition's false, we actually will jump ahead to rest of code. Um, and so this will keep happening. This, you know, we'll keep applying the update, checking the condition, doing the body, applying the update. This will keep happening again and again and again until this condition's finally false, at which point we jump to the rest of the code. I actually forgot an arrow here. Pretend there's an arrow there. Um, and so if we actually fill in some, some more precise Java syntax into here, we'll see, well, here's our for loop. We've got a variable declaration. That's something we learned fairly recently. We're creating some integer i. We're assigning it 1. What's our condition? Well, i less than or equal to 5. What's our update? i plus plus one. plus plus. We're adding 1 to i each time. So we do the initializer, we check the condition, well i is initially 1, is 1 less than or equal to 5? Yes it is, we do the body, what's the body? Well we're going to take this variable sum, which starts at 0, we're going to add i to it. We get to the bottom of the loop, the bracket here that ends the loop. Um, there's no other statement, so we jump back to the top of the loop, we apply the update, we check the condition again, and we kind of just keep going like this until eventually i is no longer less than or equal to 5. In other words, it's strictly greater than 5. Loop ends. Bam. We jump down here, rest of the code. This is the rest of the code here. So hop onto the Moodle there. Let's do a couple of um, quick review questions. Uh, what part of the for loop is this? Um, if you said initializer, you're correct. This is the initializer, condition, update, and the body. And the body, by the way, we set a block of statements, which is one or more. It's actually zero or more. Um, this is only one statement, but you could have many statements inside these brackets. And, and yes, this is another situation where we're using brackets to group things. Well, part of the loop is this. Try this one out. It's actually none of the above. It's not part of the loop. This is that rest of code part that happens uh, after the loop or at the end of the loop. So it's actually not part of the loop itself. And actually this sum equals zero, this is also not part of the loop. This is some code that just happens before the loop. So the loop is just this part. And so here's an interesting question. Uh, knowing what we know about loops and about this flowchart that describes the loop, what does this print? So try this out. Uh, try to figure this out and figure out what this prints and then answer it on the Moodle and then come back. So it's actually going to print D um, 15. I mean, it's not going to print D. It's going to print 15, which was answer D. Um, the reason for that, it's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. I is initially 1. Uh, 
So we add 1 in here to sum. We add 1 to i. i becomes 2. Is 2 less than or equal to 5? Yes, it is. So we do sum plus equals i. That's where the 2 comes in. Bottom of the loop. Go up. Add 1 to i from the i plus plus. i is now 3. Is 3 less than or equal to 5? Yes, it is. So we add 3 in here to sum. So sum, which was 0, we added 1, we added 2. Now we're adding 3. Bottom of the loop. Add 1 to i. i is now 4. 4 is less than or equal to 5. Um, so we do the body again. So we add 4 to sum. So there's that 4. Bottom of the loop. Bounce up here. i plus plus. i is now 5. 5 is less than or equal to 5 because it's equal to 5. So we're going to add 5 in here, bottom of the loop, bounce up here, i++. plus plus. Okay, i is now 6. Is 6 less than or equal to 5? No, it's not. The loop exits or kicks out. Bam, we get down here to the rest of the code. We get this print statement. We're going to have 15 because what's stored in sum is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. So that's actually what's happening with one of these for loops. For loops, these definite loops, incredibly useful incredibly powerful, incredibly cool. And so uh, I believe that's all we have for slides. Yep, stop the slides here. The rest of the stuff we're actually going to do is clicker questions in class tomorrow. So thank you very much for listening.